Hi everyone. For those of you that are new to my channel, my name is Andrew Hoffman. I'm a software engineer, a security researcher, and a technical author. I'm based out of the Pacific Northwest. And today, I wanted to explain to you zero trust architecture. Now, if you came here via web search, there's probably a lot of query terms you may have been looking for. Zero trust architecture, zero trust, zero trust security model, zero trust network model, zero trust design pattern. All of these questions lead to the same answers. So it's possible you first heard about zero trust through when it, one of the many conferences, one of the many presentations from CISOs across the world in the past three years. In fact, from what I've learned, this may be one of the most searched terms in the cybersecurity industry as of today. Well, how did that happen when this term was nowhere to be seen five or six years ago? Let's start at the beginning. So there's some history behind the term zero trust. So zero trust as a term first appeared in 1994. It was actually part of Stefan Paul Marsh, a computer scientist based out of Scotland. It was part of his University of Stirling thesis. So it was his thesis project, his doctoral thesis. He was making the claim that trust is a finite measure that could be asserted mathematically within a function. In particular, he's trying to make the claim that you can actually measure trust within a software system. That trust is something that you could either have or not have. Maybe you could even have a granular amount of trust, but regardless of if it's, if it's a binary or if it's a continuous variable, trust is something you can measure. So this computer scientist, Stefan Paul Marsh, made this assertion in 1994, and then the term dropped off the grid. But in 2018, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, aka NIST, released a publication. The publication is SP-800-207, aka Zero Trust Architecture. And this publication would revitalize the term zero trust, and it would turn it into a buzzword, and it would make everyone who didn't know what it was want to know about it, and everyone who knew, who knew what it was get tired of people asking them questions about it. And that's probably why you sent some of them to this video. So the NIST defines zero trust as a way of systematically improving security by enforcing access checks on every request rather than open-ended access groups, quote unquote, which are common in legacy systems. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you actually read through the NIST publication, it uses a couple of different terms. It uses the term implicit a lot. It also uses the term groups a lot, and it uses terms like identity a lot. So I figured it would be easier to explain zero trust architecture by giving a few examples. I'm gonna give an application security example, and I'm also going to give a network security example. So let's start with the application security example. What is zero trust or zero trust architecture in particular in regards to application security? So in a lot of legacy applications, you can assume you have two types of users. Now a user could be defined as a, an actual human user using your application or a script that's running on your servers. In the legacy world, the user in the browser accessing your website is considered to be potentially a malicious actor. But the script running that you wrote yourself on your server, you would assume that it's implicitly trusted because it's written by a developer at your company who has the company's best interests in mind. So this is where the NIST starts to pick apart what zero trust architecture is. So this is a legacy model. This is not a secure model. And the NIST will say this is not a secure model because you're giving trust to a group on the server, you're saying, you know, we have this barrier in place. The users can't access all our functionality. They can't access our databases. They can't make queries, but an internal developer, they can. They can. They have all this functionality at their fingertips. And the NIST makes note that in a modern application, it's often not code just from developers of company A. Company A may have hired company B as consultants. They may have made use in this, this server-based software of open source software. They may have purchased application licenses from various other software companies. There could be 30 or 40 or more, likely much more than that, different vendors running software on the server side. We actually have a lot of different origins 
of code running in this server, a lot of different actors. And we're still making the assumption that if it runs on our servers, it can't be malicious. So what the NIST says is that model won't work anymore. It never really worked. But in the olden days, in the 1990s, maybe you had you know 10 or 20 vendors running code on your server max. Today, it could be hundreds or thousands or more, depending on what type of application you're running. Instead, what we need to do is whenever functionality be it a user request functionality or a script request functionality, whenever functionality is requested or assets are requested, we verify the identity, we verify that they are authenticated, and we verify their authorization. So this builds on top of previous concepts in the security world, like the principle of least privilege. If we have a number of scripts running, one script is FFmpeg, and its job is to compress video files. Well, FFmpeg should only have access to what's required to do its job. It should have access to all of the libraries it needs in order to compile. It should have access to all the dependencies it needs to output an MP4. It should not have access to production databases and passwords and such. So we limit the scope using the principle of least authority, and now FFmpeg is more or less isolated. If there is additional permissions that are needed by FFmpeg on an ad hoc basis, well, we don't give it to them unless it's explicitly needed for an edge case. That's the principle of secure by default. And finally, whenever FFmpeg runs, we check the context in which it's running to see if anything has changed. We verify that it's FFmpeg running. We verify that FFmpeg is running under the correct authorization tiers. We might even need to update those authorization tiers if it turns out FFmpeg has updated and it needs access to new resources. But it's important that we're always verifying beforehand, especially whenever the context changes. Now the NIST publication, Zero Trust Architecture, aka SP-800-207, also says you should perform periodic checks to determine the identity, authentication, and authorization status of a user, even if no context has changed. So I would summarize the application security model by saying when you're writing code, when you're writing a service that runs, or when a user is requesting the functionality of a service, every time they request, if context has changed, we need to verify their identity, we need to verify they are authenticated, and we need to verify their authorization. Now, in the case of non-authenticated resources, we will verify their identity and their authorization. And those three concepts are critical for understanding zero trust. So let's move over to the network security model. In older network security models, you may use what's referred to as a castle and moat system. And what that means is you assume everyone outside of your internal network is malicious. Everyone inside of your internal network is not malicious. So the assumption here is that you're building a very strong moat, a very strong perimeter of defenses. And a lot of times this is a corporate internal network. So you go to your job at ABC company, you log into your internal VPN, and you're implicitly granted access to a lot of resources internally you may have access to company finances. You may have access to company calendars. You may have access to more than that. And you access that solely by being on the internal corporate network. The NIST says this is a bad idea. They say in the past, this may have worked. In the past, it was still vulnerable. But today, it's even more risk. There's more risk from using this model. And one of the things they call out in the Zero Trust Architecture SP-800-207, as they say, there's a lot of remote workers now. So if we allow anyone with a laptop to have access to our internal network via VPN, any, any employee with a laptop, employee gets on VPN, now employee has access to internal privilege resources. So we're making the assumption that the identity of the person controlling that laptop matches the trusted actor who is our employee. Now, what if that actor, what if that person is at a cafe and their laptop is stolen? And after the laptop is stolen, the VPN session still persists. Well, now there's a flaw in the system. And that flaw is we're still making the assumption that the identity of the person who owns the laptop is who it was previously 20 minutes ago. So this is important. There's an assumption about identity. And one of the core repeated tenets of zero trust architecture is trust, but verify. And in this case, when the laptop is stolen, whoever stole it, they still have access to that VPN session. And we're not verifying 
that their identity has not changed whenever they access internal resources. And that's very bad. So in the network security model, the idea is that we should be periodically identi verifying identity. So we need to make sure you are who you claim you are. We need to be periodically verifying authorization and authentication. So we need to know, are you able to access this? And have you proven that you have the credentials to show us you are who you claim to be? Now, let's take a little bit of a step back. So we're talking about periodic verification in this network model. And the NIST does say that you need to do that. But at its core, one of the most important tenets of zero trust architecture is that when context changes, then you always re-verify. You trust, but verify. So if we're on this VPN, on this internal network, and we're accessing HR software, when we access that software, we should re-verify to some capacity. We are who we are, and we're authorized to use that. If we're on this VPN and we're accessing version control software, we need to do the same. Verify we are who we are, and we're privileged enough to access that. And the reason why we need to do this is because consider this case. Consider the only requirement to have access to privileged internal resources is to be on the internal network. This person, person A, logs into the internal network in the morning, and then they get on VPN. So now they have access to this gated, fenced off selection of resources. Later on throughout the day, they're accused of a crime uh, on behalf of the company and they are fired. Maybe they stole company resources. Well, as long as their VPN session is still persisting and we're not re-verifying their authorization, they may have an access window of 24 hours or whatever the configuration is where they can access privileged internal resources. So the identity in this case has not changed, but the authorization has changed. The authorization of what that user should have access to. In a less malicious case, you may have someone who is in HR, they have access to HR software, and they move to finance. But if we never recheck their authorization, they may continue to have access to HR software despite being in finance. And that's a violation of the principle of least privilege. Being a finance professional now, they should have no access to the HR software because they don't need it for their job. Now, Secure by Default would say we give them the minimum, well, principle of least privilege says we give them the minimum resources required to do their job, whether it's a script, whether it's a human. If there is an edge case where it needs more permissions, Secure by Default says, oh, well, we can grant it to them if we know that this is a requirement, but by default, we never expand past the boundary of what is required for the job. So we go to the minimum, we expand outwards. We never go to the maximum and expand or, or compress downwards. So if you need access to one tool, you get access to one tool. If you later need access to another tool, you get access to another tool. And when the context changes, when your role changes, when the software used for HR changes, when any of these changes occur, we go through the process according to zero trust architecture of reevaluating your identity, reevaluating your authentication, and reevaluating your authorization. And that's my summary of zero trust architecture. That's it for today's video. I really appreciate you watching. If you have any questions or comments where I could help with clarification in regards to zero trust architecture and the zero trust design pattern, leave it in the question section below the video. Until next time.